What's up, everybody? Welcome to another week's episode of Just Saying with Justin Martindale. I'm Justin Martindale, and I'm so glad you could join us this week because we have a fun show in store for you. John, how are you, buddy? <laughs> not bad. I was no, not expecting the question that early in the episode. Right at the top of the show, I, I got to like check in with you, make sure you're time. awake, aware. I was not. You weren't. I know. Well, good news is, is that we finally have a break from this rain, and... Um, it's still a little soggy. The rock slides and mud slides are still happening. But other than that, we are out of this rain, um, which I'm excited about because I'm tired of hearing people saying, we need this. I'm like, we ugh, we, we got it. We, we don't need any more. We got it. No, we need this. It's good. No, it's fine. We, we got the rain. But um, can you, quick question, can you see the bump on my forehead real quick? Can you see it right I can. Here? Is there yeah. anything? Yeah. You can? I see something right above your eye. Right there? Yeah. Does it look like protruding? Turn your head to the side. <laughs> oh, yeah. Turn your oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. What happened? Well, I was assaulted. Um, <laughs> not by a person, but by an object. So Saturday night, I had some spots here at the store, and... Um, I went upstairs to the belly room to do the uh, bitch show by Tammy Joe, and had to use the bathroom because I, you know, sober January is still happening. We're right on course. I see the light at the end of the tunnel to February. Um, but I drank a lot of water, so I was like, I have to pee. So I went into the tiny, the tiniest bathroom upstairs in the belly room, and I'm a giant. And I walk in, the doors open. And I'm using the urinal. Oh, yeah. And I'm using it. And Craig Conant comes in and he's like, hey, man, what's up? And I look over to him and I'm like, hey, man, while I'm peeing. And I'm like, hey, man, how's it going? And I turn back around. And as I turn, somebody has installed a protruding shelf, a big protruding shelf out in the middle of the wall above the urinal. It's not like high enough. So I turned back and hit the corner of my skull in the front of right above my eye. Thank God it didn't hit my eye. And I'm like, son of a bitch. Wait, they installed it while you were turning to say hi to Craig? No, like not while I was peeing. No, it was like, it was like somebody, I had, it was never there before. <laughs> Somebody decided like, hey, let's put a, uh, a a protruding shelf so people can put their drinks. But for the tall folk like myself, it needs to be a little higher. <laughs> so I'm writing a Yelp review uh, for the comedy store. And I'm going to say everything was fine Saturday night. Uh, but that little uh, drink shelf needs to be a little higher. People came into the urinal. So people heard me and they're like, are you OK? And I'm like still peeing. I'm peeing. I'm pissing in pain. <laughs> And they're like, are you okay? And I'm like, get out. But like, yes, I'm fine. Um, and yeah, left a knot on my head. And then I start freaking out. I'm like, oh God, this is it. I have a concussion. I'm going to go home and I'm not going to wake up. I'm going to Bob Saget the shit out of this here. R.I.P. It, but, does, it does look, it, I, I hate to say it. It looks car, It looks like hammer to the head cartoonish. Thanks. Like, they, it's going to go away. So it's going to go away. It's not but like a part of your look, but it's like it looks very cartoonish, like you were hit with a hammer and it just grew out. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I was, you know, like, what is what does Justin look like? You know, like when you hit someone in the face with a hammer, it's like that. In oh, a, in a hot. cartoon. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It felt. Yeah. Like when when it hit me, it felt yeah. like like the ducks and the <laughs> all that stuff was going around. I was like, whoa, I haven't been like hit in the face in a while. And I don't plan to. Uh, in the inevitable future. But I started thinking about it. I was like, what if I go home and I lay down and I have a concussion and I thought it was just like some little like, oh, I bumped my head. And then I started, I also smoked a little weed. <laughs> and I started thinking about it. I was like, oh God, like what if I'm, what if they put me on the laugh factory? Like make God laugh. I was like, oh, there's nothing worse. I think that's what's keeping a lot of comics from killing themselves. Is they that? Just, yeah. Is the marquee. They, they so whenever wanna... somebody dies, they put a marquee up. They're like, make God laugh. And I'm like, there's nothing I want more. I do. Not, when I pass, I don't want to make God laugh. I've worked too hard. Like, at least, like, put me off the clock, you know? And, like, I'm not, like, some, like, heavenly jester who's just going to be like, hello, God. 
Finally, I'm here. No, but I, I, it, it's a nice little knot on the head. So if you're seeing this on the YouTube page, like I'm okay. But um, yeah, a rainy, rainy weekend, which meant I got to catch up on a lot of shows that I have been banking uh, post-holiday season. Um, let's see, what shows did I watch? I finished Chippendales on Hulu, which was fantastic. We have a nice Chippendale story for you. Um, I finally watched Glass Onion, which I really, really enjoyed. I don't remember liking the first Knives Out. I kind of don't remember Knives Out, really, but I really enjoyed Glass Onion, which got the Critics' Choice Award last night for Best Ensemble in a Motion Picture and Best Comedy, which I was like, okay. It was a, it, I, it was a great ensemble for sure. And then I finally watched Elvis, Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. And I actually have some amazing Elvis stories personally because uh, my family has a direct connection with Elvis. But overall, uh, there was a lot of, you know, Elvis is in the news, obviously, because we just had the Golden Globes this past week. I think last episode uh, we were taping during the actual red carpet. But did you watch the Golden Globes at all? Did you see any of the footage? No, I I wasn't in. I yeah, I saw the Brendan. No, that was a Critics' Choice. No, I ha, I didn't see the Golden Globes at all. Well, it was hosted by Gerard Carmichael, yeah. which. Eh. Oh, I saw some of those clips where the audience was just like, Ugh. yeah, it was Ugh. a little like. Mm. The Scientology joke, I will say, it was funny. It was delivered poorly because he mispronounced her name. I think it would have hit heavier. Right. Agree. But I don't think anyone in that room was going to laugh at that. Well, I did think it was kind of funny that he did make that joke and then he's like and now from top gun maverick two stars i was like holy shit he's bringing him up after that um i mean some highlights for me were definitely jennifer coolidge winning she was fantastic a lot of people are campaigning for her to host the golden globes next year which i would love but also i think it would just be so she would just get so off track but which could be chaotically funny which i think would be fun um Let's see what else we had. Uh, it's pretty much the who's who. Austin Butler won for best actor portraying Elvis. Um, and then we had a huge loss in pop culture where Lisa Marie Presley passed away two days after the Golden Globes. Now, I thought that was incredibly sad because she was only 54 years old and you actually like saw her on the red carpet and there's like some clips that have been going around where she is being interviewed and she's grabbing on um, to someone's arm and she's just like, here, I'm going to hold me up. I actually have an insider uh, who went to a Golden Globe after party and they told me that they saw her. They were sitting next to her at an after party and they saw her and they thought that she was Priscilla Presley, her mother. So I don't think she was doing well. Um, huge loss though. I mean, the only child of Elvis Presley, uh, devastating, especially after like the win with Austin Butler portraying her dad. I don't know. It's something really dark, bittersweet, and poetic you get that right no one <laughs> i feel i feel like it was just a like a nice like tribute to her father um but we'll get into some more elvis stories because there are some like theories going around overall i saw the boss lerman film and i kind of was like expecting like a moulin rouge you know romeo and juliet um strictly ballroom kind of feel I always thought I remember seeing the previews for Elvis by Baz Luhrmann and I was like what are we gonna get like what's gonna happen I thought it was I gave it like a seven and a half out of ten did you didn't like it did you John no I I I felt like it was all over the place. Mm -hmm. I, I like a linear story. I don't like flashback fast forward. Oh she likes a linear story. Yeah she does. Okay. She does. <laughs> I thought it was good it was a lot. I thought like, I, first of all, I thought the movie itself was really long, but I mean, that's what we do in Hollywood now. We make seven hour long films. Um, 
I did like the story. I liked the, it was a little fast, like kind of in those Romeo and Juliet, Claire Danes, Leo DiCaprio moments where they kind of like speed up the footage. And then they're like, oh, now he's in Memphis. And here's, here he is on Beale Street. And here he is going, you know, he bought, he bought Graceland. And so I thought overall it was okay. I did, I, I, I was kind of through thrown out of it when they mix like the doja cat and like the like the the modern music in with the you know bb king and the and and like the elvis music itself i was kind of like wait wow where am i overall it was okay it was really um really kind of sad a lot of stuff i didn't know about i did not know that elvis never traveled outside of the united states yeah that's something that i was like whoa he was the first conservatorship well, yeah, that's true. I, they left a lot out. I think I, I, I get deterred from these movies when the artist isn't, obviously the artist couldn't be involved here, but the same thing with Freddie Mercury. Like mm -hmm. when, when the artist isn't directly involved, like mm -hmm. you, you look at the Queen movie versus Straight Out of Compton where you had Dr. Dre and Ice Cube involved in that movie, two very different like ways to approach it because mm -hmm. I know at least I'm getting more of the actual story. This Elvis movie left out all of, in my opinion, left out all of the interesting things about Elvis's career that don't make him, a, like, to me, Elvis the character is good because he has a lot of flaws. This left a lot of that out. Yeah. My favorite part of the whole movie was when he starts performing, like, at the carnivals or whatever, and you just see the women just like, <laughs> ah! like, I thought that was so funny, where they cut to the women and they're just like, I don't know how to feel about this, ah! And they just start throwing their panties at him and stuff. I thought, yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was uh, an interesting, interesting story, um, and really sad loss of Lisa Marie Presley, who married. Remember, she married Michael Jackson for a hot minute and pissed everyone off. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, but I wanted to tell a little story about my family, which I think is kind of cool. So my grandmother actually went to high school with Elvis Presley back in Tupelo, Mississippi. And there was actually, when he died, there was all this like memorabilia from like Time Magazine and stuff like that, where I remember going to my grandmother's house and like flipping through those issues and like seeing her in the cafeteria, like she was one of those girls um, screaming. And um, I guess I get it from my grandma. <laughs> and... Uh, so then my grandmother and my grandfather got married. They were actually professional. Um, I don't even know what they were called. They did they did like, you know, like the 1950s sock hop stuff, but they competed together. So they would go around to different cities and like, you know, my granddad would like pick up my grandma and throw her around and, you know, the poodle skirts and all that stuff. Like swing, mu like swing music? Was it swing dancing? No, it was just swing like, dancing. it was like rock and roll. Like, you know, like okay you, it was you know what i'm talking about like 1950s like rock like, around like rock. a league of their own not like a yeah yeah kind of like that yes yes in Swing the dead. movie version yes yeah, yeah. um and so then they ended up getting married at the ripe age of i'm sure i think it was like 15 who and then my granddad ended up working for Elvis Presley when he hit it big. And so when he hit it big, he opened up a horse ranch, which was mentioned in the movie, which I thought was pretty cool. Like when they start like kind of going through their budget, they're like, we had to sell the ranch and get rid of the horses. Well, my granddad was the manager of the Circle G horse ranch. So he oversaw all of Elvis's horses. So when my mom was born, um, she would go home from school and I think as the story or the folklore says, she went to the, um, house and everyone was like, okay, just to let you know, Elvis and Priscilla are here and they're looking at horses for the ranch. And so my dad or my granddad said to Elvis, he says, you can have any horse you want. Just don't take my daughter's horse. Cause that's her favorite horse by the name of Sugarfoot. And so um, they're walking around the horses and Priscilla looks at my mom's horse and she goes, I want that one. <laughs> and they're like, no. But of course you can't say no to Elvis. So they ended up giving Sugarfoot away to Priscilla and Elvis. So my mom was devastated. So then I got the tattoo Sugarfoot on my arm. Oh my God. 
drunkenly in San Diego. And so, um, yeah, so that was the legend of, of Sugarfoot. And so the uh, story goes that like he bought everybody a Cadillac and apparently he bought my grandfather a Cadillac, a black Cadillac. I can't remember the year, but when he died, everyone knew uh, who Elvis bought a Cadillac for because I mean, you're driving around in Mississippi you know, you see a new Cadillac, you're like, oh, that's probably from Elvis. And they stripped the entire car, took all the tires, took every, any memor any memorabilia they could find. They they took it for themselves when he died because it was such a, a shock to the world. That's wild. Pretty cool, huh? You know, it'd be really funny, though. And I, I'm going to sound like a dick again, like I always do. Sure. If like your mom watches this episode and goes, OK, Justin, I have some bad news. It was all a lie. I made up that sugar yeah. story. You weren't supposed to say it on the podcast. That was gonna make that would make me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true though. Like my mom has a pair of his like glasses. Like she she has a pair. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, but uh, yeah, there's tons of memorabilia from from uh, from that era. That I remember growing up as a kid. My mom would tell me all these stories about all this and stuff. So it was pretty cool. However, I did not know this story going into this episode. Elvis's mother. Her parents were first cousins, keep it in the family, <laughs> and got married. And that's why they're saying Elvis died of cardiac arrest at 42 and Lisa Marie died of cardiac arrest at 54. And they're saying that this could possibly be a genetic disorder that's running in the family because of inbreeding or incest. Yeah. So there's that. Don't fuck family. That's what I always you say. You ain't nothing but a pound dog. Um, but overall, I thought the movie was good. Um, however, this is the story that I want to go in with. Austin Butler apparently cannot get rid of his Elvis accent and has gone on the record and saying that since he's been making this movie, I guess for the past two or three years, his accent is now part of his DNA, <laughs> which that's not a thing. So Austin Butler has heard all of the buzz about his Elvis voice, and the actor is finally weighing in after snagging a Golden Globe uh, for his portrayal of the late musical icon in Elvis by Boz Lerman. He was roasted online for his speech when viewers pointed out he's yet to drop the thick accent. Now Butler says that Southern drawl is part of his DNA. So get used to it. When asked yesterday, uh, January 10th, actually, about how his voice has changed since working on the film, which premiered in June, Butler seemed to sidestep the question. It's hard for me to talk about it. I can't really reflect on it too much. I don't know the difference. But when he was pressed about it again after winning the Golden Globe for Best Actor in a Motion Picture, Butler elaborated a bit more. I don't think I, uh, I sound like him still, but I guess I must because I hear it a lot. I often liken it to when somebody lives in another country for a long time. I had three years where Elvis was my only focus in life, so I'm sure there's just pieces of my DNA that will always be linked in that way. Then he concluded, I'm Japanese. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. That was uh, Gwen Stefani. I apologize. Butler has previously said that he picked up the Elvis accent while working on Baz Luhrmann's film and found the dialect hard to shake after being immersed in it for so long. Certain situations trigger it, he says. That was the voice I spoke in for two years. It was so habitual. You get done and you kind of don't remember what your natural voice is. Bullshit. <laughs> I said the same thing when I came home from Mississippi and Tennessee. Like, I was like, I might sound a little Southern for a bit. You just drop it. But honestly, like, it was pretty weird. I noticed it when he got up there and started talking. I was like, what is he doing? So I don't know. Maybe this is the new Austin Butler. Who knows? He's doing the Johnny Depp thing. Johnny Depp did the same exact thing. He did a movie in Paris, and now you can't tell what the fuck his accent is. Well, Johnny Depp is now a rum-fused pirate. <laughs> it's like, what? Like, officially. Like, yeah. I mean, you play Jack Sparrow for so many years, you're going to be Jack Sparrow, I guess. I, I mean, I get it, but I mean, I don't think... You can't go and say it's in your DNA now, sir. No, you know what? You don't want that. You don't want that in your DNA, because you know what's in that DNA? Incest. You don't want incest in the DNA. However, I will say this. There is a lot of biopics coming up, which I've noticed. So we've had the Elvis biopic. 
The Madonna movie's coming out, the biopic uh, about her life. I think Julia Garner actually booked that from Ozark and Inventing Anna. Um, we have, there's an Amy Winehouse biopic I just saw that's filming in the UK right now. Um, and Theo James from White Lotus, uh, who played Cameron, is being rumored to be playing George Michael in his biopic, which would, I think, be awesome. So lots of biopics coming out. We had Whitney Houston. That biopic came out. Um, any biopics we don't need? Let's see. We don't need a Gwen Stefani biopic. I would like to see that. Sandra Oh could play her. Or, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, 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 I'm excited. I like, I like a good biopic. So, um, I'm really excited about that. And here's the thing: before we started this podcast, I, the stories we have for you today, I mentioned all of these people last week, and I was like, these are all going to be on my board of 2023 to watch and guess what they're all in the news again am i doing my job or what <laughs> all right so over the weekend i'm sure you all saw britney spears went out in public <gasps> and it was really um interesting because a lot of people were saying like tmz went on to report that she had a mental breakdown in a restaurant called Joey's in Woodland Hills, which, duh, who doesn't have a mental breakdown in a restaurant in Woodland Hills? <laughs> I mean, we've all been there. Um, so there's video saying that she had a meltdown. She was speaking gibberish. Um, and that her husband, Sam Asgari, got up and left her in the restaurant. Now... If you saw the clip, it was kind of a little weird because here's the thing. This poor girl, like, she can't go anywhere. She is officially the episode of Black Mirror. I believe it was called White Bear, where if you haven't seen if you haven't seen Black Mirror yet, God, get into it. Get into it now. It's the best show. I think it's the best one of the best shows ever. There's a there's an episode called White Bear where this woman wakes up and she sees that everyone's just recording her from her phone. And I'm not going to give everything away. But that's what this was like for her. She goes to a restaurant. I'm sure everyone was gooped and gagged. And they're like, oh, my God, it's Britney Spears in a restaurant. They all pull out their phones like you do at a Joey's in Woodland Hills and start recording her. So she's just like, can I just have my pesto pasta, please? No, she's not having a pesto pasta. Britney's probably having like a... A blackened chicken fettuccine. Or a barbecue Southwest chicken salad. Sticking to my guns. I believe she did that. So now her husband, Sam, is saying, he says to Page Six News today, that's not what happened. Let me break it down for you. Britney Spears' husband shut it, shut it all down. That she did not have a meltdown. He took to his Instagram stories. Can we stop taking to our Instagram stories? <laughs> Like, just just be a person and just be like, you know, release a statement to the news and be like, that's not what happened. We don't need to, we don't need to see you in the moment all the time, you know, especially when it involves like your wife and like her reputation. Maybe don't take it to your Instagram stories. So he took it to her Instagram stories on Saturday night to defend his wife saying, don't believe what you read online, people. And we have a nice little picture of them. He's really holding on to her there. Uh, the actor's post came hours after TMZ published a story saying that she caused a scene at Joey in Woodland Hills, California. I think it's Joey's, not Joey. Um, eyewitnesses claim to the website that the Hold Me Closer singer, which is still the worst song, Hold Me Closer, oh, was acting manic and talking gibberish, prompting the former personal trainer to, quote, quote, storm out. So this is her at Joey's. However, a video obtained by TMZ appeared to contradict the eyewitness account, simply showing Spears shielding her face with a menu while another patron filmed her on a cell phone in the middle of the establishment. So the footage notably did not show Spears incoherently 
or uh, Asgari leaving in a huff. A manager at Joey's previously told Page Six that they could not disclose any information about the celebrity couple's headline-making visit. I don't think she. I don't think she uh, was. Um, but now. Someone has come forward, an employee actually has come forward, saying the disruptor wasn't Britney. It was the diner who taunted her by taking a video without consent. The staffer explains that Spears was understandably upset and that Asgari only left briefly to get his car, but he did not storm out. I believe this. And then she took to Instagram like she does. Y'all don't even know me. Y'all don't know me. So she posted an Instagram video, which I'm sure she all everyone saw. She's given the middle finger, which, by the way, can we stop taking pictures where we're flipping off the camera? It's so basic. <laughs> it's just so dumb. Like, I just see, like, I've been seeing, like, a lot of people just being like, Ugh. I'm like, what are you doing? Come on. What is it, 2019? Ugh. I'm so hardcore. Ugh. Shut up. <laughs> Oh, yeah, look how rough you are. So she's pissing off people. So she puts the middle finger up and she writes on Sunday night, I know the news is all hyped up about me being a little drunk at a restaurant. It's like they'll be watching my every move, y'all. I'm so flattered they talk about me like a maniac. Then have the balls to talk about all the negative things that happened in my past. The Grammy winner spent nearly 14 years in a conservatorship, which gave her now estranged father, Jamie Spears, control of her personal, medical, and financial affairs. So... You know what? The poor girl can't even be free. You know, let her go. You know, this would you know what? This would never happen in a cheesecake factory. That's that's true. Yeah. I think in a cheesecake factory, no matter I think if Britney Spears walked into a cheesecake factory, I wouldn't even question it. Nobody's taking video and you're in a cheesecake factory. No one wants to take video no. in a cheesecake factory. There are bigger things going on. Oh yeah. I went to Ikea this weekend and I was like, oh God, I hope no one sees me. <laughs> the one by the one by me in Burbank? The one yeah, the one that in Burbank. The worst escape room I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't end. It's an escape room for sure. There's fluorescent lighting. You feel like you're in that show Severance. Like you just see like a bin filled with like toilet brushes. I'm sorry, Sflugensflagens. <laughs> And you're just like, how do I get out of here? All of it, like the arrows that are projected on the floor at one point just all start meshing <laughs> together and you can't get out. Then out of nowhere, you'll just hear a scream from like over here and then over there. And then I started and I also smoked a little weed when I went to Ikea. Maybe that was my fault again. But there's, you know, the little showrooms in the Ikea. Yeah. So they're like, you know, oh, here's the living room that you could make or whatever. So I walked in at one point and I turned the corner and there was a woman sitting on the bed. <laughs> and in my head, I thought, get out of my house. <laughs> it was weird because you just feel like you're in this like environment of like, oh, yeah, this could be like I could I could be in this space. And then you turn the corner and someone's just like. Ah! And you're like, oh, God, how'd you get in here? So, um, yeah, I get it. I, I wouldn't want somebody like seeing me at like a like like, I don't know, a Chili's I would be OK with. A Texas Roadhouse I could do, but like, yeah, Ikea or like an Arby's. Oh, no, don't take don't take my picture. This is this is my secret. I'm taking taking with me. Um. We have this next story, uh, Demi Lovato, or as I call her, Demi Gelato, uh, was in the headlines again. It's been a while. We haven't heard from Demi in a while, um, but I thought this was kind of cool because Demi is like now, she re they, ah, oh, fuck, what is it now? I she, think she's a she, she's a she again. She went back, she went back, right? She's a she, yeah. Demi's a she. I think she was like, my pronouns are out of control. I'm going to go back to she. So thank God. So Demi's pissing off all these people. Uh, we'll call them Christians because this is the article. Demi Lovato poster banned for being offensive to Christians. She's pissing off Christians. Her album, which is called Holy Fuck. <laughs> Mommy don't know that it's getting hot in the body shop. They're, like, there's a whole moment happening right now with like weird like 
Catholic opera, I guess. Sam Smith and Kim Petras. And now we're like embracing this weird like rock and roll religious horny vibe, which sure. Let's get a little rock and roll. I like a little bit of punk. So um, her album is called Holy Fuck. And the poster, she's wearing a bondage style outfit and lying on a crucifix shaped bed. It has been banned for causing offense to the Christians. The title of the singer's new album, Holy Fuck, clearly alluded to a swear word. Uh-huh, I just said it. And together with the image, linked sexuality to a sacred symbol the UK's advertising watchdog found. Polydor Records said it was artwork designed to promote the album and did not believe it to be offensive. The poster received four complaints. <laughs> four. Four. It was removed after four days. Wow. That sounds kind of biblical. And on the fourth day, there were four complaints. And after the fourth day, it was removed. Um, the Advertising Standards Authority said it had received complaints relating to the image of Miss Lovato bound up in a bondage-style outfit whilst laying on a mattress shaped like a crucifix. The singer was in a position with her legs bound to one side, which was reminiscent of Christ on the cross. Together with the album title, which is a play on a swear word, holy fuck, the ASA found the poster was likely to be viewed as linking sexuality to the sacred symbol of the crucifix and the crucifixion. This was likely to cause serious offense to Christians. Demi Lovato's eighth album was released in August of last year. It documented her complicated journey through alcohol and drug addiction, mental health issues, treatment, and recovery. Um... I don't know what to say because like this next phrase says, the singer is not the first to spark controversy in religious circles. Madonna's Like a Prayer video was condemned by Christian organizations as blasphemous when it was released in 1989. You remember she had a black Jesus. There were burning crosses. Everyone was losing it. And you know what? Everyone's still okay. We all made it through. So, um... They said the ASA found that the title of the album would be clear to most readers that this alluded to a swear word or as the poster appeared in a public place where children were likely to be able to see it. They consider that the ad was likely to result in serious and widespread offense and has been targeted irresponsibly. Um, I don't know. You know what? If you don't want your kids to be offended, don't. Let them listen to it. I don't know. I think maybe this is her going, you know, after her post Disney days and they're like, oh, my God, she's on a couch shaped like a cross. I just she think Christians worrying about kids is the most ironic thing in the fucking world. Now, if she was wearing Balenciaga, <laughs> then we would be a little upset. No, I mean, whatever. I think this is just rock and roll. It's it's she's being she's being cool for the summer. You know, it's like. If this is the, the 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 biggest problem you have. Also, I love that it was like we have to remove this after four complaints. But meanwhile, Prince Harry can make an audiobook talking about his frostbitten dick and that's okay. I'm on team Demi on this one. Sorry. I think it's stupid. Now, here we go. Let's talk about the dark arts. We're going to go from Demi Lovato's suggestive um, satanic couch <laughs> to Shakira, Shakira. Okay, this story came out over the weekend and I didn't really understand it at first. I'm going to read it to you guys all here on uh, the podcast. Shakira taunts her ex-mother-in-law with a witch doll on her balcony. I'm already in it for the headline alone. A witch doll on a balcony. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for it. So Shakira conjured up drama this past weekend after allegedly putting up a witch-like mannequin on a balcony at her Barcelona, Spain home, which happens to face her ex-mother-in-law's house. Uh, so the rumor comes just days after the singer released a new song that fans say is meant to mock her former spouse. The Colombian entertainer currently under investigation for fraud in Spain and her soccer player, Beau Gerard Piquet, split in June of 2022 following claims that he was cheating on Shakira, Shakira. <laughs> the cursed allegations come from Piquet's mother, 
God, what is this name? Montserrat Bernabo. <laughs> I'm sure I just butchered the shit out of that. Who told reporters in Barcelona of a doll dressed in black with wild gray hair, a pointy hat, and mounted on a broomstick, which she could see propped upon Shakira's terrace. And here is the witch. Now, first of all, I think it's kind of weird that your mother and your... Wait, if you're living across the way from your mother-in-law, that's too close. Too close. And I don't think they were legally married. I think um, they were just kind of boyfriend-girlfriend for the entire time. But one one reporter said that the ex-mother-in-law was worried the singer was doing something else with the doll. <gasps> like what? Well, weeks ago, I got some information that PK's mother was worried about an alleged ritual that was done to her with a black witch, uh, tweeted a reporter, according to uh, Twitter's own translation. Milan said he ignored the claims until a fan of Shakira reported to him the same story. So I went to check if this information was true or not, and sure enough, there was a life-size black witch with a white beard, he continued. So I guess everyone was saying, hey, Shakira's got a witch on her patio. Let's go check it out. I would do the same thing. Hey, did you hear about the uh, balcony witch at Shakira's place? Let's go check it out. Now, more to the story is that the creepy decor is not the only thing Shakira's neighbors have to deal with. According to one of them, the artist has been blasting her latest single, you know, the one slamming her ex, his new lover, and yes, even her former mother-in-law. So one of the lyrics in the song is, You left my mother-in-law as my neighbor, with the press at the door and the depth in the treasury. <laughs> you know, like those, uh, <laughs> those lyrical gems. The Post reached out to the Hips Don't Lie singer for comment. Meanwhile, followers of the story on social media have been stirring the pot since the photos were posted. Shakira setting up a witch mannequin on her balcony to face her ex-mother-in-law's house while blasting her diss track about her ex-boyfriend at full volume is the petty standard we should all aspire to in 2023. Yeah. And someone said, you really are a she-wolf. You're a legend. The witch idea is really cool. Okay. So is it petty to put a witch on a patio facing your ex-mother-in-law and cursing her because of her son's alleged infidelity? God, that's a lot. This is why you got to raise your kids to not cheat. I said go for it. Yeah, I'm on board. Yeah, I'm all about a good witch curse. And it's even more because it's like Colombian bruja, you know? It's not like an Americanized witch. This is like Colombia, Colombia witch. Like those, those, like this is Latin witch. Latin witches mean business, you know? You're going to get into some like Santeria and like La Llorona, Yolanda Saldivar. Oh. Those Latin witches, they mean business. So if I was uh, Shakira's mother-in-law, um, yeah, I'd move. I don't know. I feel, I, I you know, I think, she, I think Shakira could step it up a little bit. Maybe like leave a, a goat on her doorstep or maybe some like Blair Witch sticks all around like her apartment. You know, and eat up Shakira. <laughs> Ah, speaking of witches, Madonna uh, is in the news again because she is embarking on a career spanning 40, uh, 40 years. So it's an, a 40th anniversary tour. The Global Trek will celebrate Madonna's deep catalog of hits, sources tell Billboard. Madonna is planning a massive anniversary tour later this year with her longtime concert promoter, partner and producer, Live Nation, and music manager, Guy Osiri. Sources tell Billboard the 64-year-old pop icon will perform music from her entire catalog dating back to her 1983 self-titled debut album through her most recent studio album, 2019's Madam X. Still haven't heard it. The world tour will begin uh, will be Madonna's first ever career retrospective featuring a compilation of her biggest hits across four decades of music and will reportedly include a multi-night run at the O2 Arena in London. 
It's going to be the biggest tour she's ever done, one executive familiar with her plans tell Billboard. The tour will include both stadium and arena dates, the source says, and include over-the-top production that delivers both material girl kitsch and occasionally outrageous sex appeal with plenty of show-stopping moments made for social media. I'm sure we're going to get such moments as Madonna under the couch, uh, under Demi Lovato's crucifixion couch. Maybe we'll get Madonna scaring people with her grill. Madonna with her lace front face mask. Madonna humping a refrigerator. The tour buzz comes just after months Madonna, uh, after Madonna released her career-spanning compilation album, Finally Enough Love, Finally Enough Love. 50 number one spanning her entire dance club career, featuring remixes by top producers, including 20 rare recordings officially released for the first time. In 2021, Madonna signed a deal with Warner Music Group for an extensive multi-year series of catalog releases that will revisit the groundbreaking music that made her an international icon. Um, I think this is going to be good for her. I think it's going to be expensive as shit uh, because that's, I mean, let's be real. It's going to be Madonna. She hasn't gone on tour in a while. Madonna will have no shortage of songs to choose from. That's for damn sure. With 57 titles charting on the build, Hot 100, 38 Top 10 hits and 12 number ones, including Vogue, Music, um, released a decade apart and spending 24 weeks on the Hot 100. Borderline from 84 spent 30 weeks on the Hot 100. Um, Take a Bow, which held number one for uh, seven weeks. So are we excited for a 64-year-old Madonna tour? Yes. No. But, I, but I'm not paying. I'm not paying tickets for it. There are only a few people I'll see after they're 60, and that's those are people that are sitting down playing music. So that's Billy Joel, Elton John, or or someone who's not going crazy around the. She's not even close. But like Celine Dion, who's not going to be running around dancing on the stage. She, she's just there for the voice. Madonna, she's going to pass out on stage. She's I don't not- think she'll pass out. But remember, there was the there was the clip of her. I think it was uh, it went viral. It was uh, from her. I think it was from her Madame X tour where she went through her like her weird like matador phase where she was like, oh, I'm going to dress up like a matador. And she went up the stairs and they tried to rip her cape off, but the cape didn't come off and they pulled her off the stairs. She's like, it's a celebrate. <laughs> and you just see this like woman fall down i feel like if she if that happened to her now it would be the end scene from death becomes her (laughs) it would just be like you know legs and arms and limbs and she'd be like do you remember where you parked the car um i don't know i i i think it would be good i think i think the reason she's doing this tour is because of tiktok because that's where we are what do you mean because while we were do while we were on lockdown, Madonna got on TikTok and she kind of introduced the younger generations to her songs. My favorite Madonna song, "Frozen," from 1998, which was from the Ray of Light video, a uh, Ray of Light album rather. Uh, so "Frozen," she resampled, uh, or she let TikTok make that a sound. So it was like the, you know, and everyone was using that in their TikToks. And then I think she uh, a couple of her older songs have now gone back into the more popular music. Same thing happened with Kate Bush running up that hill. Like, you know, song from the 80s, it came back hot. And now Bloody Mary by Lady Gaga has officially entered the charts this week, which was from her album like 10 years ago. Bloody Mary is now number one, thanks to Wednesday, the Netflix series. And they sampled... Bloody Mary in the Wednesday dance uh, number. God, good at my job. I'm sorry. You know who else is great at their job? This woman. So over the weekend, this story kind of blew up, and I didn't understand what it was about or what it pertained to. Did you see any of the memes that were going around about this next story? They were pretty amazing. They were, and I was like, who is this? And my brother, you know, I have family in Tennessee. This actually happened in Tennessee. Um, uh, big Tennessee episode this <laughs> this week. We go from Elvis to this troll. This woman. Okay, I just have to read the headline. Five officers were fired as a sex scandal 
Royals, the Tennessee Police Department. Now, I didn't know what I was reading, but here we go. If you saw the memes, this woman uh, was the butt of the joke and the memes. So this Tennessee Police Department was in turmoil following allegations that at least five of its male officers had sex with a female officer both on and off the job. So far, five officers have been fired and three more have been suspended without pay as officials in the Nashville suburb of Laverne investigate the allegations against the 60-person police department. This situation is, situation is unacceptable, and as soon as it was brought to our attention, it was immediately investigated and action was taken upon the individuals involved. Our top priority moving forward... <laughs> will include rebuilding the public's trust. The accounts of Laverne police officers were in an internal report about the department's investigation. The officers spoke about sharing cell phone photos of their genitals, having sex in the police station on duty, and taking part in girls gone wild type parties. The actions of a few do not represent the department as a whole, no pun intended, D Davis said that despite the firings and suspensions, we have sufficient staff to cover all our patrol shifts. So apparently this woman just like gang banged her entire department. I don't Is think it was at once. I think she was just fucking around. Uh, or maybe, maybe it was. Girls Gone Wild got pretty wild. But I mean, yeah, but like Girls Gone Wild. No one's talked about Girls Gone Wild since like 2000. Yeah, since we got rid of VHS tapes. Maybe they're still around in Tennessee. Oh, that's true. Probably. So Megan Hall, the female officer at the center of the scandal, she's been fired. Uh, also sacked were Sergeant Lewis Powell, Sergeant Henry Ty McGowan, Detective Seneca Shields, and Officer Juan Lugo Perez. So, and this is her? So that's her. Looks like and she's from right Tennessee, but she's, she's more of... Five someone. <laughs> she's more of four, I see. <laughs> This girl boned her entire department. You know what? Good for her. Why can't, you know, do you know how many people I know like at restaurants, like staff members who are all just like boning each other? And there's nothing done about that. A lot of them were at Joey's restaurant in Woodland Hills. <laughs> Those sous chefs, man, I tell you, they get into some kinky shit. Oh, I'll show you a scrimp. Scampy fettuccine. Um, I don't know. Uh, so she's been fired. Oh, wait, there's more. So apparently this woman's married. Oh, no. Yes. No. She's married and got caught um, boning her entire department. And her husband is saying he's going to stick by her side. Oh. I know. I wonder what he looks like. And I don't want to hear stick by her side after like she's uh, been caught gang banging her entire patrol. I just love that she looks like she's waiting for a high five. I mean, to be fair, this woman looks like she looks like Chip the teacup from Beauty and the Beast that came to life. That's at least what I think. But also now I don't want to think of Chip getting gang banged. <laughs> that's just weird. That's 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 a cupboard I don't want to be opening anytime soon. But uh, I guess we'll just keep following this story. Uh, and Tennessee, get your shit together, Jesus. Um, now it's time for my mentally ill story of the week. This woman, I, I, I always am infatuated with these like my strange addiction kind of people. There, you know, we have the we had the guy who married a, a a doll a couple episodes back. We had, you know, you always have like those people who are like eat their couch. They have a strange addiction to eating chalk or whatever. This woman married her duvet cover and says it's the most intimate relationship of her life, which I'm like, go on. Pascal Selleck appeared on This Morning to talk to Philip Schofield and Holly Willoughby about her marriage to her duvet. The fans were shocked this week when a woman opened up about marrying her duvet. Um, she met the the host of this show this morning, uh, which I don't know, I don't know where exactly that is, but uh, 
She told him she married her duvet. The artist held an open wedding ceremony on Valentine's Day in 2019 and invited members of the public, her family, and her boyfriend to witness? Bitch, your duvet is your side piece? All right. So calling it love at first sight, the woman said, I have other duvets before, but I'm always loyal to this one. It gives me warmth and comfort. Um, I'm not mad at her. You know what? Especially during these like rainy cold days, I too was married to my duvet. It was a cozy earth duvet. Um, they don't talk back. They're always there. Uh, they warm my feet. And she says, it's always there for me in time of sadness and happiness. It's definitely not sexual. It's just like a friendship. <laughs> I hope it's not sexual. God. How did, she how did she somehow make it sound worse? I know. She's like, my duvet's just there for me. We're not boning or anything. There's not a train being run on me, Tennessee. She went on to say her boyfriend completely understands her relationship with the blanket. Johnny, my boyfriend, understands I'm marrying the duvet for art. Oh, okay. Now it's for art. And to come across a message, we have a really loving relationship. He's not jealous of my duvet. In fact, he's very proud of me. My duvet is, is a single at the moment. When I get married, it will get a double. What? <sighs> After confused looks by Philip and Holly, Pascal explained the relationship with her duvet is not sexual but close. The wedding was, in fact, an art project highlighting loneliness in society. She added, it's kind of a message around Valentine's people. What do you mean, Valentine's people? <laughs> Valentine's people. Um, people can also, they feel sometimes a little bit lonely. So it's like, actually, you know what? Take some time for self-worth, self-care, and have some time under your duvet and marry your bedding. Why not? Everybody loves their duvet. The service was followed by a wedding reception at a art house. And during the celebration, Pascal cuddled into her duvet for their first dance to Dido's Thank You, which was performed by a local band. Is this a picture? <gasps> this is the wedding reception, which I'm not mad at. I can't be mad at this. This woman is comfortable in her duvet. They look happy. You know what? If I if I was married to du my duvet, which uh, who says I'm not? Um, my my first song would be Sade. Um, this is no ordinary love because I'm married to my bedding. By the way, happy birthday, Sade! It's her birthday today. Um, what happened? Like, I'm just sitting here. Mind, what happened after COVID? Everyone lost their goddamn mind. We had a guy who wants to be a dog. A girl's marrying her blanket. Mm -hmm. What's happening? I, I, I'm just saying that people are bonkers. And that's what we're here for. Because every week that goes by, I'm like, what crazy story am I going to find in the news? And then it'll be like, local woman finds a, a new skin regime, skin regime, uh, putting her own feces on her face and i'm like well here we are i think people just lost their mind this isn't as bad i mean if her boyfriend's in on it if there's like a i like a good like thruple with a duvet it's harmless and also i feel like the word thruple sounds like a thread count you know What's the thruple on that? Oh, it's 500. Is walking to Bed Bath & Beyond. Where are the fuckable blankets? <laughs> She's not having sex with the blanket. Oh, so, sorry. That, if there was sex with the blanket, then I would be like, okay. But she's just like, you know, having a moment. She's just cuddled up next to her boyfriend duvet and, you know, it's cold outside. She puts on some Dido and she's just living her life. I think that's great. More power to her. I love a good, <laughs> what is this saying about me? Am I turning into one of my own stories? Yeah, I don't want any power going to her. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's fucking a Snuggie. I'm good. She She's not fucking a Snuggie. She is just cuddling in her blanket, but is like getting headlines for it. So mad. If there's soup involved, I'm out. If... <laughs> Don't eat in bed. That's all I have to say. Now, 
Um, I mentioned earlier that I finished the series Chippendales on Hulu, which I recommend everybody to watch. It was really good. Um, our friend here at the store, Adam Ray, plays the MC at Chippendales. I actually am trying to get him on the podcast so we can talk more about that and what it was like to work with, you know, Murray Bartlett and uh, uh, Julia uh, Juliet Lewis. It's a it's an amazing cast, really cool. Um, but as I was watching this, the um, I had a lot of questions about the actual story because it is uh, the owner of Chippendales and the creator Christian. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Steve Banerjee. He had a son which we don't see in the series, but I was like, I wonder where his kids are now and wonder where his wife is now because, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the Chip and Hills documentary, he uh, kills his partner, uh, played by Murray Bartlett, in, in the actual documentary um, because the partner ends up making Chip and Dale's, like what Chip and Dale's was. Uh, Steve Banerjee just wanted to kind of be famous in LA and open up a backgammon club, which sounds amazing. I mean, who doesn't want to go to a backgammon club in LA? And he kind of came in and was like, you have an amazing space. Let's make a, uh, you know, an all male review. Let's get the ladies hot and bothered in the eighties and Chip and Nails kind of blew up to what it was. Uh, he ended up firing or no, uh, his partner ended up leaving and moving to New York and kind of franchised Chip and Nails in New York and made it like this exclusive women's uh, cabaret for male dancers. And, you know, there was like VIP sections and celebrities would come into town and, you know, it was kind of like a new brandish version of Studio 54. And Steve Banerjee got jealous, hired a hitman to go kill him and then lied about it and then got caught by the FBI and went to prison. And the day before his trial, hanged himself in his prison cell. Yep, that's what happened. So I got online and I was like, well, I wonder what happened to his ex-wife because his ex-wife was the accountant for Chippendales. They had a couple kids. Uh, they have a daughter in the show, but I did not know that they ended up having a son as well. So I was like, this story pops up. And it's now about how Steve Banerjee's son, the owner, is now a stripper himself. <gasps> Keep it in the family, just like Elvis's grandparents. Now, this story, I'm going to read a little bit if you scroll down here. Uh, his name is Christian Banerjee. Uh, he says that stripping is not a job for him. It is a spiritual calling. OK, it wasn't the fact that he wanted to be a stripper. It was his destiny. Banerjee 31 told the post. It wasn't like I saw a magic mic and wanted to emulate what I've seen. This came from a much deeper place in my soul. After all, Banerjee is a strip tease scion. In 1979, his late father, Salman Steve Banerjee, a paunchy but ambitious immigrant from Bombay, India, turned a Los Angeles bar over here on Overland. Uh, into a male stripper den called Chippendales. He took it to dizzying heights in the 80s, raking in millions in international tours and merchandise. Nobody was brave enough to send out male strippers and nobody monetized it like my father did, said the Huntington Beach, California resident who launched his own company, wait for it, Strippendales, in early 2020. Unlike his dad, who was in on the business side, Banerjee is also... The gyrating talent. Oh, so it's just <laughs> one Strippendale. Justin Strippendale. I will only be referred to as that from now on. But behind his family legacy, the G-strings and glossy camp veneer of the 80s beefcake phenomenon is a bloody tale of greed, arson, FBI informants, and murder. So the documentary, if you want to check that out, is called Secrets of the Chip and Nail Murders. It's on a and &E. I think there's actually another one on Hulu. But here he is. This is... Uh, Christian Banerjee, this is his dad, Steve. Uh, as his nightclub, which was crawling with shirtless men and bow ties and cuffs, became a huge draw in L.A., he hired Nick DeNoya, played by uh, Murray Bartlett, an Emmy-winning children's producer. Uh, he whipped the group of hunks into dazzling vegas as trope and suggested opening a Big Apple location. He proposed a deal which jotted down on a napkin. Okay, here we go. This is what I wanted to say. Napkin contracts are having such a moment now. If you've seen The Glass Onion, if you've seen 
Chippendales. If you've seen Boz Lerman's Elvis, they all have one thing in common. Contracts written on napkins. Am I wrong? You're not. Right. It's weird. I saw like all three of these over the weekend during the rainy monsoon season while I was not having sex with my duvet. And I was like, wait a minute. All of these have contracts written on napkins. Stop doing that. Nothing good comes from a contract written on a napkin. Get a lawyer involved and do it like an adult. So yeah, they wrote this contract out and Nick DeNoya used some verbiage that was not familiar to Steve Banerjee because he was from India. So his English wasn't like, you know, very well. He didn't like know um, uh, legal terms. And he ended up like writing on this napkin that he was going to get 50% of the company. And Nick was like, well, actually, I'm going to take a little more and you're not going to know because we wrote this agreement on a napkin. So stop writing your agreements on napkins. Uh, so Fed Up Banerjee decide to have Nick Denoya killed, enlisting pal Ray Cologne, who hired a junkie named Louis Lopez to shoot him. He walked into his midtown office in Manhattan, shot him in the face. The case went unsolved uh, until uh, this was what I thought was weird. An emboldened Banerjee then put out a hit on two members of the rival troupe Adonis, Men of Hollywood, out in London. And that's when the FBI found out about it because it went sour. And the FBI found out that he was trying to assassinate uh, the competition, so to speak. And uh, yeah, it was pretty it's a pretty good, uh, interesting story. Uh, however, I do uh, think we need to check in on Christian Banerjee, uh, the only <laughs> dancer at Strippendale shouldn't even be called Strippendales, just just one Dale. Um and what a, what a time to start a stripping business because we all know how the beginning of 2020 went. Are you doing Zoom strips? You just like, <laughs> hey, my Venmo is. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of interested to see how that goes. Uh, if we do see a Strippendales, which we probably aren't. And is it full nudity? Because Chippendales was not full nudity. It was just like G-strings and, you know, wet women. I like to call that just enough nudity. <laughs> Just enough nudity? Yeah. I don't know. If it's Strippendales, I feel like 2023, you need to go full nude. You know what? There was a place in Atlanta, Georgia called Swingin' Richards, <laughs> which was called Swingin' Dicks. And it shut down RIP during covid um, and I went there once and I, and I, I remember being there with like my buddy, Julie Goldman. And we went, we were doing a show in Atlanta and they were like, you got to go to swing and Richards. And I was like, all right. And we went in there and like, you know, you see like guys dancing and you're like, okay, they're just like go-go dancers. And then all of a sudden they're like getting butt naked and you're like, oh, wow. And I was that bitch who decided to be like taking a picture of Britney Spears and Woodland Hills. And they were like, sir, delete that. I'm like, yeah, what am I doing? What, what am I what am I taking a picture of? You're that guy. I was that that guy in a female strip club where they get fully naked. But Swing and Richards was a shit. If you ever had the chance to go to Atlanta and go to Swing and Richards, it was a good time. Um, all right. So we're going from Swing and Dick <laughs> to a woke dick. Um, this week is, uh, MLK day, uh, was celebrated this week. And this story is kind of blowing up the internet. So I've seen it for the, you know, past couple of days, a $10 million MLK statue, uh, was just revealed. And I believe the city of Boston and people have lost their minds, especially Coretta Scott King's uh, family. So this statue was unveiled for MLK Day. And a lot of people don't know exactly what they're seeing. So the story reads, uh, this statue that cost $10 million was just dedicated to Coretta Scott King and her iconic civil rights leader husband, Martin Luther King, in Boston, with a cousin claiming... It looks like a penis. I have a peen. 
<laughs> the massive bronze piece. Careful there, Tennessee. Relax. Titled The Embrace features two sets of arms holding each other, an artistic interpretation of the classic photo of Coretta and hubby Martin Luther King Jr. hugging after he won the Nobel Peace Prize, no pun intended, in 1964. The mainstream media was reporting on it like it was all beautiful because they were told they had to say that. Seneca Scott, Coretta's cousin, told the Post by phone Sunday, referring to the new artwork on the Boston Common. But then when it came out, a little boy pointed out, that's a penis. <laughs> and everyone was like, yo, that's a big old dong, said the 43-year-old Oakland, California resident. If you had showed that statue to anyone in the hood, they'd have been like, no, absolutely not. Now, let's see the statue. Can we go down? Go Oh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you I mean I see it I see it here go up a little bit well this is what it was supposed to be minus the bodies it was supposed to be this hug an embrace it's called the embrace so I mean, we're getting that. We're getting like the little pearls on the wrist. We're getting a wedding ring. But yeah, it looks like it looks like someone holding a big old schlong. Yeah. And it doesn't help. Like people were taking pictures from different angles and it looks worse and worse from each angle. Mm hmm. Uh, look, it's so bad. I mean, that's not bad right there. From that angle. That's the only passable angle where it doesn't look like a dick. Yeah. But let's go down. I want to read a little bit more of this. Whoa, 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 whoa. Go back. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, right at the, at the, go right here. Yeah. Okay. So wait, go up. I want to see who's he. He, he, he. Oh, is this the cousin? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the cousin wrote scornfully in Compact Magazine, $10 million were wasted to create a masturbatory metal homage to my legendary family members, one of the all-time greatest American families. Seneca told the Post that woke culture allowed the expensive abstract experiment to come to fruition. Members of the King family last week unveiled the artwork near where MLK and Coretta first met in college. Uh, let's see... Martin Luther King III approved the piece, which was designed by conceptual artist Hank Willis Thomas for the organization Embrace Boston. The artwork's funding was the result of a public-slash-private fundraising partnership the city of Boston set on its online site. It's unclear how much public money may have gone into the sculpture. When we recognize that all storytelling is an abstraction, all representation is an abstraction, hopefully it allows us to be open to more dynamic and complex forms of representation that don't stick us to narrative that oversimplifies a person or their legacy. And I think this work really tries to get to the heart of that, the artist says on their website. But Seneca... The relative says, if you went through all of that and that's what you came up with, something's wrong. <laughs> Online critics were harsh, too, including some who agreed that the work was pornographic. Oh, no, 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 wait, wait. Online critics were harsh, too, including some who agreed that this work was pornographic. This is awful. The British rapper and podcaster Zuby. Oh, OK. <laughs> added in a tweet. Thanks, Zuby. Um and I feel like the other people who were offended were four Christians from the UK who banned this sculpture. Sculpture. It's not bad. Look, it's also like in the shape of a heart. You know what? People just want to be upset about it. Wait, wait, wait. What was that? Here we go. Seneca's grandfather was one of 25 children of Jeff Scott, the son of a slave who became one of Alabama's wealthiest black landowners, Seneca said. His grandfather's brother, Obadiah, fathered Coretta, whom Seneca said he met once at a family reunion before her 2006 death. He couldn't speak for the other family members of the family. He felt the 25-foot-wide, 65,000-pound sculpture was a waste of money that should be melted down. A solid bronze statue? Like, what are we doing here? He asked. I don't know, remembering a legacy? I mean, I it's not that bad. I just feel like if you go around to a different angle, yeah, sure. 
if you look at something from any sort of angle, it's going to look like a dong. That's pretty fair. Right? Yeah. I think so. Here. Here's for instance. So there is a restaurant on Santa Monica Boulevard at the corner of La Cienega and Santa Monica Boulevard. And it was an Italian restaurant that I actually worked at many years ago. And then it shut down. It was actually the building where Jim Morrison recorded L.A. Woman. It used to be a music studio back in the 70s. So it was shut down for a whole while. And then all of a sudden it uh, turned into what else? A hot dog stand. I don't know if you've seen this hot dog stand, but it is like a restaurant and it's indoor, outdoor. And on the outside, I guess, is where you order your hot dogs. And it is just a huge wiener. Buns and wiener. So the sides of the hot dog stand are buns and wiener. And the wieners come out of the sides. I'm just going to keep doing this and see. Oh, yeah. So the wieners come out of the side of the buns. Now, every time I drive by there, I'm always like, okay, I want to know how many gay boys from West Hollywood or straight people, whatever, are leaving the bars from West Hollywood and walking home and are taking pictures <laughs> of this dong and are putting it in their mouth, trying to put it in their butt, whatever they're doing, just to get that picture and be stupid and silly. Now, I'm telling people, don't do this to the Martin Luther King statue <laughs> because then you're going too far. But I think it's a great piece. I think anything... Uh, now I felt weird saying this is a great piece because now I'm like, oh. Do I think it's a waste of money? Sure. But you know what? What isn't a waste of money these days? Um, but uh, how do I end with this? Being like, here's to the legacy of Martin Luther King. <laughs> Don't hold that dong too tight. Um, how do I end this? Melt it down. How do I end this? Wait, melt it down? Just melt it down. Melt it down? And do what with it? I don't know. That's what they That's what they said about the bronze statue. Uh, that should be our closing line for every episode. Melt it down. Yeah. Have you read? Have you seen the stories we covered today? Just burn it all. I mean, yeah, there were some good stories. I mean, I do... Uh, I, I, I thought we really touched on some moments. We had Elvis, you know, uh, we had some family history, uh, Demi Lovato's pissing people off again. Shakira put a witch on her balcony. A woman married her duvet. I think nature's on its way to healing. You know, we put up a nice bronze dong and memoriam for MLK day. I think we're doing okay so far. What a way to kick off the year. I mean, yeah. And it's only January. It's so only let, January. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Do you know what else I thought? I thought today I went, Oh God, I missed a groundhog day. <laughs> Groundhog Day is not until like February 2nd I was like oh shit but like I think I'm the only person in this country that was like oh god I missed Groundhog Day and here's something are we still allowed to call them groundhogs I don't know is Groundhog offensive don't know yet we'll find out in February but for now that concludes this week's episode of Just Saying make sure to hit uh, that uh, subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us a review and rate us. We always love to hear from you. And hit me up in those DMs. Follow me at Justin Martindale on Instagram if you want to get a story on the air. Hey, hit me up. Maybe it will. We'll see you next time on Just Saying with Justin Martindale.